Good evening and welcome to the Kogan Institute for the Humanities at Brown and to our fall 2021 Meet the Fellows event. I'm Amanda Anderson, the director of the Institute, and it's my great pleasure to be hosting this event, which will showcase the research of our annual fellows through a series of speed talks. I wanna welcome everyone who has joined us for this event, whether you're here on the Brown campus in larger Providence, part of the Brown alumni community, or dialing in from afar for one reason or another. We're thrilled to be holding this year's fellows seminar, the regular weekly seminar in person. And we had our first meeting today in Pembroke Hall on the Brown campus. It was really wonderful. Many of the fellows remarked that it was the first time they had been in a room with this number of colleagues since March, 2020. The pressures of our fully remote existence last year prompted some valuable innovations. And one of them, I think, was this particular format, the Meet the Fellows webinar. This event allows us to reach a much wider audience and to share the work of our fellows in a dynamic format. The Fellows Seminar is the heart of the Kogut Institute. In it, approximately 20 annual fellows gather weekly to pursue research projects, to ask each other hard questions and to provide constructive feedback. These annual fellows include faculty, undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows. This bringing together of scholars, not only from a wide array of disciplines across the humanities and the humanistic social sciences, but also from different stages of career, is one of the most generative and unusual aspects of our fellowship community. The Kogut Institute is relatively unique in its inclusion of undergraduate fellows, though a lot of institutes are now moving to include undergraduates, and you will be hearing from two of our undergraduate fellows this evening. Another distinctive feature is the impressive large cohort of postdoctoral fellows jointly housed in academic departments and the Institute. Postdocs add enormously to the life of the Institute and the university bringing cutting edge research questions to the fellow seminar and to their teaching within departments. Due to the success of the postdoctoral fellows program and the generous support of the Mellon Foundation and individual donors, we have a permanent endowed fund for our Mellon postdoctoral fellows earned through a challenge grant from the foundation. I'm also grateful to Brown University for its continued unwavering support for the postdoctoral fellowships in international humanities, which adds so much to the life of the Institute. In addition to supporting a unique fellows community, the Kogut Institute also serves as an intellectual commons at Brown through initiatives on topics in environmentalism, racial justice, the global humanities, and collaboration within and beyond the humanities. In addition to these initiatives, we will also be continuing our special project on the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century humanities PhD and featuring a special series on democracy from a humanities perspective, which we first launched last spring. Before we turn to tonight's talks, I wanna thank as always, the dedicated teamwork of the Kogut staff, which has just been stalwart throughout the entire last 18 months and Brown's media services department, which is famous for its um, seamless webinars. So here's how we will proceed. I'm gonna introduce two fellows at a time. We have 10 talks with so two fellows at a time. We'll be mixing up the groups of fellows so that, so that you'll hear scholars from different stages of career in each pairing. We made some effort to pair talks that had some sort of connection to each other, but we really just invite you to be thinking about how the various talks speak to each other either within the pairings or across the whole. Our first speaker will be Lubaba Chaudhary, a doctoral candidate in the Department of English whose dissertation investigates Caribbean women's literary, journalistic, and activist contributions to anti-colonial, anti-racist, and feminist movements, both in the Anglophone, Caribbean, and the diaspora in Britain during the latter half of the 20th century. She will be followed by Rebecca Carter, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Urban Studies. Professor Carter's research focuses on the cultivation of Black urban futures through the tracing of everyday conditions 
of structural and social violence and their reconfiguration by a creativity, kinship, and relatedness. Please enjoy these first two talks. Thank you for that introduction, Amanda. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank you so much uh, for attending this evening's event. And thank you so much to the Coket Institute for the support and community it has provided me, uh, even in these early days of the semester as I work towards completing my dissertation. I arrived at my dissertation project entitled Caribbean Women's Literature and Afro-Asian Intimacies, 1948 to 2001, through my graduate education, of course, but also through my experiences as a student activist. I distinctly remember reading scholar Carol Boyce Davies's book, Left of Karl Marx, which has quickly become the definitive biography of Black feminist communist Claudia Jones in Professor Paget Henry's introductory Africana theory class, which I took in my second year at Brown. This scholarly work stayed with me because it challenged the strict bifurcation that I feel is pervasive in both academic and activist circles, namely that one can be an academic or an activist, but rarely both at the same time. Born in 1915, Claudia Jones was someone who read, wrote, and thought extensively about the pressing issues of her day. Jim Crow, American and British imperialist design upon her native uh, Trinidad and Tobago, the Black woman's oppression, uh, as a racialized, gendered underclass. Jones wrote about the issues that drove her to action, issues of racial inequity that led her to organizing the Notting Hill Carnival in London in 1959, and a London-based March on Washington to parallel Martin Luther King Jr.'s March in 1963. What struck me most about Jones was her ability to make connections between seemingly disparate political ideologies, practices, and peoples. Not only that, but she also seemed to insist on the importance of connection and relationality above all else, even if this emphasis distanced her from her comrades in the Communist Party. In particular, Jones's increasing suspicions about Soviet imperialist designs on the global South and her admiration for Maoism's achievements placed her at odds with her former comrades. In a 1962 letter to her partner and colleague, Abhimanyu Manchanda, Jones writes, I have had to convince some of my old colleagues that I'm in a different orbit now. And it's not that I've turned my face from them, but that I faced the reality of where my face was turned nearly six years ago. As Jones turned her face away from a dogmatic allegiance to Stalinism and towards the promise of an anti-imperial, anti-racist and feminist third world, but did not have to pledge allegiance to America or Russia. She modeled the promises and the liberatory spirit of a politics based on friendship. Jones's changing orientation towards party politics and her steadfast commitment to building long lasting relationships with other third world leaders and thinkers resonated with me as a scholar, but also as an activist who has always had to find new homes for my activism, precisely because I refuse to be pressed into line to use cultural critic Sarah Ahmed's turn of phrase. This particular orientation towards politics, which places emphasis on the intimacy of friendship across national, racial and gendered lines became the guiding principle of my dissertation. My most recent preoccupation has been with Jones's writing on friendship and love, but I've also examined Caribbean women's writers' novels, poems, and life writing as representations of the intimate, where cross-racial intimacies go beyond the fragility and contingency of solidarity or coalition politics. Jones is an important part of this study but she was also the spark for this project, the catalyst for my own thinking about the liberatory potential of the interpersonal, the intimate, and the everyday. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Amanda, for the introduction, and thanks to everyone who helped put this event together. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Rebecca Louise Carter, and I am an associate professor here at Brown, jointly appointed in anthropology and urban studies. My research responds to the conditions of vulnerability and violence that persist in the world, a broad concern that proceeds with new urgency in the precarious and increasingly partitioned urban world, working against the tendency in both scholarly and public discourse to locate and then leave such conditions within poor black and brown communities, I examine the ways in which they are produced and transformed, exploring where and how people live and what they imagine and do. I recently published my first book, titled Prayers for the People, Homicide and Humanity in the Crescent City. This is a historical and ethnographic study of the religious work of African-Americans in New Orleans who mourn the dead 
primarily the young black men who are most frequently the victims of homicide. Identifying a larger system of social death while well illuminated in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, the book documents how residents assert black social and spiritual value. With the Baptist church as a primary site, the book follows clergy and parishioners as they engage in anti-violence demonstrations, as well as more intimate support groups to mark the birth and death anniversaries of lost loved ones in a form of restorative kinship. I trace more broadly the emergence of a religious ideal that extends from the legacies of black social Christianity while it advances the frameworks of a sacred black humanity in the crafting of a beloved and just urban society. At the Kogut Institute this fall, I will take up a lingering concern, which has to do with the repetitive weight of black death in this vibrant but volatile setting, as well as the desire to conceptualize and inhabit a black world as a beginning, a middle and an end in itself. That is a world where transformative practices are understood, not just within the context of, or as a countering force to the structures that perpetuate the space of death, but as facets of human existence that situate black being in, through, and perhaps altogether beyond a particular place, history, or set of circumstances. I am inspired here by recent scholarship related to the development of a radically humanist anthropology, which moves from the recognition of state violence to a consideration of social and political possibility and new forms of sovereignty, to the development of effective practices of witnessing and repair and to the articulation of the aesthetics of black aliveness. And I draw here from the work of Deborah Thomas, Ryan Jobson, and Brown's own Kevin Kwashi. These are powerful ideas given the intersected crises of the world. And I explore them ethnographically, aligning with a multimodal approach that reconsiders existing paradigms for research, representation, and knowledge circulation. This work is fueled also by creative practice including auto-ethnographic and collaborative writing, drawing and painting, and new media in the form of digital and experimental animation. This allows me to explore black worldness from multiple vantage points, collapsing the distinctions we otherwise maintain between the past and the present, between erasure and emergence, between death and life itself. I am thus working on a remix of my book using photographs and interview excerpts along with hand-drawn and cut paper puppetry to create a series of short animated scenes centering the lives and experiences of Black youth. I'm also developing a related project in collaboration with the Pawtucket Public Library that will train local youth to document their lives within the broader context of urban decline, strategic economic development, and the imagined city. I look forward to the work and fellowship ahead. Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful talks, which I, I think exemplify particularly creative forms of engaged scholarship. Next, we will hear from two scholars working at the intersection of the social sciences and the humanities. Scott Frickel is professor of sociology and environment and society and serves as community engagement core leader for Brown's Superfund research program. He's particularly interested in the politics of science, systems of disciplinary knowledge and interdisciplinary collaboration. He's currently studying the relationship between hazardous land uses, regulatory science, inequality and health in Argentina and the United States. Scott will be followed by Irina Kalinka, a doctoral student in the Department of Modern Culture and Media. Her research is situated at the intersection of critical and political theory with a focus on digital media. Her dissertation examines the political imaginary of what she calls user democracy. We'll turn first to Scott. Thank you, Amanda, and hello, everybody. As Amanda mentioned, my name is Scott Frickel. I'm a professor of sociology, and I also hold a joint appointment at the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. And as Amanda also mentioned, I am lead the Community Engagement Corps for Brown's Superfund Research Program. My research and teaching point to the intersection of politics, knowledge, and nature. And in particular, I'm interested in understanding how knowledge about chemicals, pollution, risk, and regulation informs our understanding of public health and environmental inequality. While I'm a Kogut Fellow, 
I'll develop a new project set um, in Rhode Island entitled Ground Truth and Historical Sociology of Urban Soils. This project builds from two previous studies. My 2018 book, Sites Unseen, written with urban sociologist Jim Elliott, is a detailed empirical analysis of the incremental but relentless accumulation of industrial hazards across urban landscapes. In a new book called Residues, due out this fall, my co-authors and I identify chemical residues as socio-material objects, and we develop a theoretical framework for following residues to track their world-altering powers. As I envision it, ground truth will marry the empirics of the first book with the theoretical emphasis of the second. I aim in this project to construct a history of soil contamination science and policy and its relationship to urbanization and inequality in Rhode Island since the 1960s. I begin by asking, what is contaminated soil? Since 1980, federal legislation requires landowners to investigate and when necessary, clean up contaminated properties prior to their sale and redevelopment. Within this regulatory framework, the problem of soil contamination, what and where it is, how we know, and what we do about it, has become a central axis upon which the wheels of urban land use and reuse turn or stall. The study will combine computational analysis of government documents with other humanistic social science methods using interviews, archives, and ethnography. It is anchored in a close study of site investigation reports managed by the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. There are currently more than 2,000 of these reports dating back to the 19, late 1960s. Together, they constitute a record of epistemological and ecological change. And through them, I plan to trace regulatory officials' evolving interactions with lawyers and engineers, toxicologists and chemists, realtors, bankers, and planners. Their individual and collective decisions and non-decisions generate shared understandings of clean and polluted soil that have lubricated Rhode Island's urban development and helped explain its consequent social and environmental disparities. Taking an interdisciplinary approach to my research subject, I hope to peer into the quasi-public settings in which knowledge about soil quality is produced and implemented, not in abstract regulations, statistics, and reports coming from offices in Washington, DC, but locally and literally on the ground in neighborhoods and communities across the state. It promises to reveal how ostensibly public but largely hidden processes unfolding in law firms, private testing laboratories, planning offices, and real estate markets inscribe the science and policy of soil contamination onto urban landscapes, invisibly structuring the entwined social geographies of environmental injustice and privilege. Thank you, and I very much look forward to working with my seminar colleagues this year. Hi everyone, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to introduce my work and thank you to Amanda and everyone at the COGUT for their amazing support and for organizing this event. In May 2014, I was elected to the County Council of Teltow Fleming. This county is located on the southern border of Berlin where it is most densely populated, but also stretches deep outwards into the rural areas of the state around the city. Here I was, just two years after finishing my bachelor's degree in political theory, all of a sudden representing around 170,000 people for the Green Party of Germany. The same year, a majority of Germans now owned a smartphone. Facebook usage continued to rapidly grow, especially among older generations. Quite a few of my fellow representatives, and the average age of the council was around 60 plus, added me as friends on the platform. We discussed issues within the party and across party lines and local Facebook groups, and I felt like local politics was becoming much more accessible. One could stay informed or participate without having to make the time to travel far out into the rural parts of the county where public transportation was hard to come by. Organizing felt much easier too, as everyone was sharing local news and events and initiatives on one platform. 
Being part of a small opposition party, I also appreciated just how easy it was to publicly note my dissent. Then in 2015, 1.3 million people came to Europe to request asylum. My county was tasked with housing and supporting our share of these newcomers. Facebook groups coordinating local support efforts became popular, but at the same time, racist memes and misinformation was spreading and trending everywhere. The moderators of the local county Facebook groups we had all been using started more and more deleting or not deleting content based on their own political leanings. Fellow Green Party members and pro-refugee activists reported seeing their comments disappearing and becoming the target of online hate campaigns. Offline, a refugee housing project in my town was burned down. Across the state, racist hate crimes doubled from 2014 to 15. A research project from Warwick University later demonstrated what we were anecdotally uh, witnessing at the time. Facebook amplified hate and was a driver of increasing anti-refugee attacks in Germany. In towns where Facebook usage rose, even one standard deviation above the national average, attacks on refugees increased by about 50%. Today, my research focuses on the intersection of political theory and digital media studies, and is informed by some of the trends I was witnessing firsthand during that time. My dissertation project explores what I call the political imaginary of user democracy. Here I aim to show how digital platforms are not only facilitators of both democratic and anti-democratic tendencies, as we could see, but also engender their own normative conceptualization of what it means to do democracy or politics more broadly, properly. This includes defining what information is in the public interest, who should be gatekeepers, what constitutes quote unquote healthy but public discourse, so kind of biopolitics of communication, but also such normative questions like what are good citizenship practices and pedagogies in the digital era. But critiquing corporate platform power alone is not enough. Informed by my own time as a public servant, I also want to ask as part of my work, what do we value in the construction of common spaces that articulate shared stakes across communities? How can we protect public spaces and public discourse from being overdetermined and governed by unaccountable interests? How do we live and teach democratic values in the digital era? So in other words, how do we, might we opt into digital media spaces, understood as critically important infrastructures of public speech in the present, and fight to bring them closer to our conception of the public good, possibly through radical transformation? Thank you for those powerful and fascinating talks, which managed to diagnose larger social systems while still remaining locally grounded and attuned to individual and local experience. Our next speaker is Adrian Hernandez Acosta, a postdoctoral fellow in international humanities in the Department of Hispanic Studies and the Kogut Institute for the Humanities. He's also affiliated with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Department of American Studies, and the Ethnic Studies Concentration. His research and teaching explored the literary, religious, and theoretical aspects of 20th and 21st century Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban texts. He will be followed by Diego Rodriguez Langevin, an undergraduate pursuing a combined degree in neuroscience and philosophical inquiry through creative forms. In their multiple affiliations and powerful engagement with cultural forms, both of these scholars are especially resonant examples of humanities scholarship at Brown. We'll start with Adrian. Good evening to all and thank you, Amanda, for that introduction. I also want to thank the COVID Institute as a whole for this opportunity and those who helped plan this event. As Amanda said, my name is Adrian Emmanuel Hernandez Acosta, and I am a postdoctoral fellow in the Hispanic Studies Department. I'm an interdisciplinary humanities scholar whose research explores the role played morning in the formation of race, religion, gender, and sexuality through readings of African diaspora religion, Hispanic and Caribbean literature and culture. My current research project provides critical inventory of the ways in which African diaspora religions broadly understood to include not only Cuban Santeria and Dominican Vodou, but also Caribbean forms of Christianity and spiritism. These religions are portrayed in scenes of death and mourning within literature, cinema, and visual art. 
This critical inventory theorizes what I call a mortuary poetics, that is an analytic that enables me to study the various literary and artistic techniques by which portrayals of religions circumvent social and psychic losses sustained within structures of power that disproportionately affect racialized feminine, queer, and trans persons, all while contending material loss of radical singular embodiment for which there is no resurrection. Therefore, mortuary poetics takes anti-Black racism and antagonism against feminine, queer, and trans life as salient context within which both cultural objects and their creators work through mourning. My project tarries possibilities and limits of mortuary poetics in ways that touch on broader theoretical and methodological questions of historical opacity, retrieval, and continuity, questions that are familiar to and indeed animate the study of literature, religion, sex life, race, gender, and sexuality. I approach these broader questions with an understanding of racial formation, not only as historically dynamic and geographically specific, but also as traveling along transnational circuits shaped as much by colonial legacy as by anti-colonial solidarity with all the fraught complexity that comes with those solidarities. To that end, my work highlights the importance of centering both the Dominican Republic and regional and hemispheric histories of and ethnicity and Dominican Vodou in the study of African diaspora religions, a subfield that has historically been dominated by other traditions. For example, my work responds to Black Dominican scholar Fibio Torres Ayan's claim that the Dominican Republic is historically, quote, the cradle of racial Blackness in the Americas. The readings of contemporary Dominican literature and cinema that begin with the death of a major character, like the 2017 film Cocote by Nelson Carlo de los Santos Arias, or the 2014 novella Mata y la Nada by the late Alana Lockwood, I argue that the cradle of which Torres Sayan speaks is also a cemetery and therefore claims to new beginnings contend with the continuities that structure such beginnings. And here I'm thinking theoretically with both Sophia Hartman's and Jacques Derrida's respective reconstructions of periodization, afterlife in Hartman's case and ontology in Derrida's case, both terms of course emphasizing the ghostly or the spectral. As another example, I also read scenes from Dominican writer Rita Indiana Hernandez's dystopian novel La Mucama de Omicunle, or tentacle as it is known in its official English translation, to demonstrate how these historical continuities shape racialized genders and sexualities. I walk with those central queer and trans characters to analyze how they generatively reformulate the ways in which death and mourning organize racialized temporality, all while in ritual relations with divine forces. Today, I'm interested in how Black and other racialized Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban characters and their creators use as for religious resources to alleviate or otherwise respond to the psychic distress that brought on not only by personal loss, but also by its recurrence in a world seemingly determined to let the lives of so many away. Thanks for hearing me out, and I hope to meet at least some of those from the Brown community listening today throughout this year. Hello. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. Um, as was said, I am an undergraduate, I'm one of the undergraduate fellows, and I am double concentrating, double concentrating in neuroscience and a philosophical inquiry through creative forms, which is an independent concentration. Um, in neuroscience, I do mostly work with learning and memory at the molecular genetics level, um, while in this more humanities-oriented humanities uh, concentration, I'm working primarily with uh, the representations of madness by Dominican writer Rita Indiana, which I was, was just very pleasantly surprised to hear Adrián is also working with, um, and Puerto Rican poet Francisco Mato Paoli, which is, who is also my great grandfather. I actually came um, to start working with this uh, poet um, because my grandmother was, had been working uh, the last years of her life uh, editing his work. Um, and I began uh, working with uh, her books as a kind of a um, commemoration of uh, her unfinished work. Um, I'm interested specifically um, in how madness is used politically in Puerto Rico, especially in the 1950s uh, with the nationalist and independence struggle which my great grandfather was a part of and was incarcerated because of. 
In prison, he develops uh, a psychiatric condition which is deemed terminally ill. And when he is transferred from prison to the asylum, uh, he writes this poem called Elogio a la Locura, or, uh, or sorry, uh, Canto de la Locura, um, or it's the Song of Madness, where he expresses his views on how madness is a political phenomenon. Um, I'm also interested in how he justifies um, the how political activists are ne are necessarily um, go mad uh, in their search for a uh, true freedom for in this case Puerto Rico. Um, meanwhile, Rita Indiana in her novel uh, La Mucama de Mi Cunle, uh, uses um, uh, she ex she experiences or uh, represents the artistic genius as a kind of madness, um, which she um, which gives kind of uh, this space for the localized um, experience of the Caribbean, um, which echoes the um, the word that we use for madness in Spanish, locura, uh, which comes from locus eh, or placement in Latin. And my end goal with this project is to show a uh, comparative analysis between Rita's work and Francisco's work, um, which shows how madness is a condition or a, a psychiatric or cognitive condition uh, that is necessary for the writer or the poet and, and that can have, have a revolutionary ability to create and inhabit or convey a, the delocalization of worlds um, that present alternative politics to the reader. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Adrian and Diego, uh, for those two talks, which I think both kind of think powerfully about the interplay of race, profound existential or limit experiences, cultural context, historical continuities and discontinuities, and of course, art. Um, those were both just amazing. Next, we will hear from two scholars who are interested in various forms of performance and the conditions under which they take place. Jane Fryman is an undergraduate, double concentrating in American studies and comparative literature. Her extremely timely senior thesis traces the history of masking and masking laws taking New York City as a case study. Michelle Clayton is Associate Professor of Hispanic Studies and Comparative Literature. Her current project focuses on the role played by dance as image and practice in the international avant-garde. Thank you to Amanda and the Kogut staff for organizing this event. I'm Jane and I'm a senior double concentrating in American Studies and Comparative Literature. And this year I'll be writing a thesis in American studies about a recently repealed New York state law that banned the wearing of masks in public. My project will combine legal, historical, and cultural studies approaches with a particular emphasis on theories of masking and masquerade drawn from queer theory and queer of color critique. The most recent version of the law in question defines a loitering person as someone who, being masked or in any manner disguised by unusual or unnatural attire or facial alteration, loiters, remains, or congregates in a public place with other persons so masked or disguised, except that such conduct is not unlawful when it occurs in connection with a masquerade party or like entertainment. The first version of this law was established in 1845 after a group of white tenant farmers dressed up as Native Americans and donned masks to assault police officers anonymously. Since then, the law has been instrumentalized to criminalize many different groups of people, including members of the KKK, but also protesters, drag performers, gender variant and trans people, sex workers, and especially Black and Latinx folks in low-income neighborhoods. I'm interested in untangling the law's desire to make its subjects visible and legible in order to make them legislatable. How does this law define a face, a masked face, a non-face, et cetera? Further, I ask why so-called disguise is seen as a threat to normative legal worlds and why the mask as both a material object and a symbol comes to embody and adorn these fears. 
Moreover, I seek to understand whether excess, opacity, and refusal, as qualities sometimes produced by masking, can be rewritten and revalued as radical modes of critique, freedom, and survival. The first seeds of this project were planted when I was enrolled in a class called Masquerade as Critique, which was taught by a former Pembroke fellow, Leah Perez. The class gathered together art historical, visual studies, black studies, and queer studies approaches to concepts of masking, doubleness, costuming, and concealment. During that same semester, I came across an oral history by Sylvia Rivera in which she referenced New York's anti-mask law, section 240.35.4 of the Penal Code, as the law that was used to arrest trans sex workers in Stonewall era New York City. Several, several months later, I returned to this reference and began to look deeper into the history of the law. By this point, the COVID-19 pandemic had made it so that masks were the topic of everyday conversation. And in the midst of much debate about laws that required face masks, I found it interesting to consider the history of laws that banned mask wearing in the United States. So there have been roughly two main waves of statewide anti-mask laws, first in the 1920s and then during the civil rights era, and both purportedly arose in response to Klan violence. The New York law is therefore somewhat unique in its early emergence. Again, the first version was written in 1845, and the second and most recent version persisted until May 2020. At this point, New York, in May 2020, New York Attorney General Letitia James called for the law's repeal, stating that the banning of public mask wearing conflicted with the state's new mask mandate. So my research attempts to bridge the historical dimensions of the law with these contemporary politics of the mask, particularly in regards to the law's criminalization of drag, gender variance, and various forms of protest. Thank you all so much for listening. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to Amanda, to the COGUT staff for putting this together, for everybody participating um, in the event. It's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Michelle Clayton. I'm an associate professor of Hispanic studies and comparative literature at Brown, and I'll be using my semester at the COGUT to finish a book I've been working on for a number of years under the title Moving Bodies of the Avant-Garde. It's a project that looks at the underexplored place of dance in the first three decades of the 20th century, looking at dance's relationship to other art forms, such as writing, painting, textiles, film, and architecture, and of course, other art forms relationship to dance. The project started when I noticed how many writers and visual artists in the period were drawn to dance as muse or model for their own work, and how much dancers in turn were in conversations with experiments in other art forms at the same time that they were reading what was written about them, responding to artistic captures of their works and incorporating or inserting their choreographies into broader debates about what modern art should be, what it should look like, how it should move and how it should move its public. And this against a backdrop that stretches across Europe and the Americas that entails various different regional as well as artistic languages and in which I'm arguing dance functioned as a form of translation. The book tracks the emergence of new forms of dance in the newly emergent spaces of popular culture, such as world fairs, amusement parks, variety shows and cinemas. It looks at their translation into artistic form by dancers, writers and artists working together to explain the transfigured art form to a public. And it explores the, the responses of a variety of publics to what becomes a circulating art form, a kind of cultural commons to be reacted to and reworked. To give you a concrete example, in a chapter on Charlie Chaplin, I demonstrate first how Chaplin's radical new art was compared to dance by commentators and by Chaplin himself, who worked images of dance into many of his movies, sometimes as instances of grace, but sometimes paradoxically uh, to illustrate the awkwardness of fellow feeling. From here, I moved to show how Chaplin was being read by diverse publics across the West. As Peruvian theorist Jose Carlos Mariategui wrote, he is enjoyed equally by bookworms and boxers alike. And once we compare the various readings of Chaplin put forth in intellectual but also popular circles throughout the 1910s and 20s, it becomes clear that he was serving as a cultural touchstone for many publics to articulate their own version of modernity. Chaplin put his mutely eloquent moving body up for grabs, we might say, and with it, everyone made their own cultural assemblage. This play with moving bodies becomes even more dynamic in the case of actual dancers. 
For most of the 19th century, dance had been associated with ethnography, with something to be visited in place like the flamenco dance seen by numerous American and French visitors to Spain. But when it began to be incorporated into world's fairs and variety shows in the late 19th century, dancers started to design repertoires that offered experiences of travel, travel in space, but also in time. On the one hand, they developed choreographies based on gestures seen in classical ceramics, friezes, and statuary, promising to restore grace to spasmodic modern bodies. But on the other hand, they presented themselves as mediums of foreign culture, sometimes claiming personal experience of other cultures, more often drawing upon book reports. The dancers thus styled themselves as animators of museums and libraries, offering vicarious forms of research travel. Something very curious happens when these bodies themselves begin to travel. During the First World War, when European theatres were shuttered, dancers embarked on looping tours of the Americas. And as they traveled around Latin America, performing exotic and often exoticizing repertoires, one after another became pulled into conversations with local intellectuals. And gradually, they turned from producing dances based on Greek and Roman sculpture to artistic experiments with pre-Columbian pasts, working with materials that were still in the process of excavation and interrogation by local intellectuals, entering into complex collaborations with artists, writers, musicians, and textile artists on the ground, all of whom were engaged in processes of animating, reanimating, and interanimating their national and regional pasts. I look forward to discussing these and other contact zones over the course of the semester with all of the fellows. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for those talks, Jane and Michelle. And last but not least, Veronica Fitzpatrick is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Modern Culture and Media and the Kogut Institute. Veronica is a media scholar working on a book length close reading of The Bachelor. Thank you so much to Amanda and the other presenters and everybody who's here listening. I'm Veronica Fitzpatrick. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Kogut via Modern Culture and Media. Um, my work on film and television broadly concerns genre, form, and the dimly perceptible. I wrote my dissertation on post-1960 horror cinema, and I'll be teaching a course in the spring titled What We Talk About When We Talk About Horror. But this semester, I'm teaching a seminar on romance and masochism that ties directly into my book project, the working title of which is A Bachelor's Discourse. A Bachelor's Discourse reconstructs the alphabetic fragmentary form of Roland Barthes' 1977 A Lover's Discourse. The contents consist of vignettes rather than conventional monograph chapters, and this formal strategy is critical to the book's argument, which proposes that reality dating and relationship series typified by the global franchise The Bachelor supply contemporary figures of speech that surround and shape our thinking about romantic love. In his foreword to the 2010 edition, Wayne Kustenbaum characterizes Barth's catalog as unified in, quote, the fight against received wisdom, obviousness, stereotype. My project applies the form of a work embattled against stereotype to an object that's popularly misconstrued as consisting solely of stereotype. Following Bart, my objective with this accumulative, decentered, aphoristic form is to drift beyond the obvious toward an undiscovered but recognizable discursive site. So what is The Bachelor or why The Bachelor? I gave a very preliminary talk on this research a few years ago in Cambridge and I had this dark suspicion that others had selected my panel having interpreted my title as referring to some kind of conceptual figure like the Flanor, when in fact the term is literal and industrial with regard to reality TV, albeit also theoretical. For the uninitiated, The Bachelor is a reality series wherein contestants compete for the love of a single lead according to a narrative arc that begins with an endless cocktail party and ends in engagement. Thoroughly ironic despite its earnestness, it's an elimination-based competition that rewards contestants for building community. Nine weeks of televised polyamory aim at affirming the couple form and what Alain Badu calls the family universe. In its distension and condensation of the relationship as TV season, The Bachelor alters natural time, proffering a kind of hyperactively straight time, wherein the season moves fast while the episodes move slow, a paradox not unlike that of the narrative suspension and perpetual cliffhanger of the soap opera. Yet what I argue is that the fundamental logic of The Bachelor is less temporal and more linguistic. The show speaks itself with a lexicon drawn from cast confessionals fortified through social media. For example, declarations of love reinforce a conventional timeline of emotional attachment from falling in love to being in love 
to not being able to see yourself without the other person. It's critical to respect this progression and to see oneself within it. Under this project is Lauren Berlant's distinction between an attachment whose breakage results in mere disappointment and one whose relation to optimism has apocalyptic results for the optimist. They write, when your pen breaks, you don't think this is the end of writing. But if a relation in which you invested fantasies of your own coherence and potential breaks down, the world itself feels endangered. One of The Bachelor's most consistent and for me compelling tropes projects the speaker forward in time via a kind of conditional vision. I can see a future with him. I can see myself with her or my personal favorite, the lead's early conviction that my wife or my husband is in this room. It's a very populated room, an idiom of impossible certainty unaccompanied by any indication of precisely where. The room to which the sentiment refers is unknowingly diffuse, well beyond the production structures of inhabitants. It's what producers call the bubble, an achronological presentness of physical and intellectual captivity, an emotional petri dish in which love can grow like mold. I'm thrilled to undertake the research for this project with the support of the Koga Institute, the community of my fellow fellows and the productive willingness of my Thursday evening class. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, that was wonderful. Um, I, I think that those two talks leave us with a sense of the breadth of the uh, contemporary humanities and uh, from, the, from the angry adolescent poet of the 16th century um, to the bachelor. Um, and I, I also just, first of all, what, the one thing I hate about webinars is the lack of um, applause and fellowship. We really need to get a really convincing applause track that we can, that we can play. Um, but I just want to at least myself channel, hopefully channel um, the audience's appreciation of those extraordinary presentations of ongoing research. Um, one thing that just really struck me was the combination of profound forms of ethical and political commitment, extraordinary archival research, and attentive analytic um, power and, and what we call in literature, close reading. I want to thank all the fellows who participated and also thank everyone who joined us this evening. We will have a second installment of this series in the spring when you can hear from the rest of our annual fellows for the year. And I ask you to please check out our website to explore coming events. Um, First of all, on next Monday, there's going to be a welcome by the Initiative in Environmental Humanities. And that's always a terrific event. Well, it will only be the second one, but uh, they did it last fall. And it's, um, it's also virtual, but it's a really powerful event. I also encourage all Brown University students and faculty to look into our various funding opportunities and especially our fellowship programs. Um, there are links uh, coming into the chat on, on the various things that I mentioned. You can see more events on our events calendar and you can sign up for our mailings on our website. Um, so that's really the end of our, of our event tonight. And I just wanna warmly thank the fellows who I thought just did an incredible job with their presentations. And I hope everybody has a productive and safe fall and uh, you know, enjoy the new opportunities for being in person together. Stay safe, be well. <laughs>